Okay, it's asking me to continue recording. Well, I'll answer it rashly. So, um, yes, it's recording now. You okay. just need to share your screen. All right, let's start there because nobody wants to look at me this morning. They just want to look. Okay, and I will say right up front, Ashley and I did not have any discussion about choosing the same PowerPoint background for our stuff today. <laughs> this was complete luck of the draw. Um, well, this look at that. Yeah, it's, I saw hers and went, oh, great minds think alike. So they asked me today if I would talk um, about reproductive management sheep. Certainly in my practice, I'm getting more and more inquiries, questions, um, people who are interested in it, uh, people who want to do out of season lambing. And so it's becoming a lot more mainstream than it used to be. So there's a lot of information in this presentation. I'm going to hit the highlights due to the time constraints because I can't teach you everything you'd want to know about uh, managing reproduction in your sheep in 45 minutes. Um, but there's more detail in the presentation and I'll make the presentation available um, to Alberta Lamb, like they are recording it, but I'll also uh, send Ashley a PDF of the actual PowerPoint slides that they can post on their website. And that way, some of the details you can refer back to because it's a lot to take in all at the beginning. And so that might make it a little bit easier for everybody. Okay, so this is just a little bit of an outline of what we're gonna cover today. The first is the big why. Why manipulate reproduction? Why do synchronization? Why not just throw the rams out in the field and lamb in March and April? Um, which is what, if you left the sheep to their own devices, the majority of sheep would want to do. Um, we're gonna cover a little bit on reproductive physiology of the ewe. I'm gonna do this because I think you need to understand what's going on in the, the sheep in order to understand how the manipulations and the drugs can work and why sometimes we see failures because you're trying to make something happen that's not reproductively possible for the sheep at that time. And then we'll cover the main types of manipulating uh, the estrus cycle or the breeding cycle, either in season, out of season, and in the transitional period. So the big why, because that's usually the first question I ask clients. Why do you want to do this? You know, what, what's kind of the end game? So a lot of it now is that um, time and labor is a key economic um, component to sheep production. And a lot of my clients that have sheep also have other jobs or they're in mixed farms with other things going on. And so they wanna be able to plan their time, the use of their labor in their facilities. And they also, um, a lot of times are wanting to plan where they can market lambs to maximize the income from lambs. Also targeted nutrition, tighter groups that are in the same stage of pregnancy at the same time are easier to feed than groups that are spread out over months of pregnancy. If you have ewes in a feeding group that are 30 days pregnant and ewes that are about to lamb, um, that's very hard to feed them appropriately as a group, especially as the industry moves into a lot of these more prolific breeds that require a bit better nutritional management around lambing time. And then also improving health in young stock. Um, tight groups of lambs being born in short periods of time so that you have groups of lambs that are all the same age helps prevent uh, disease situations where you get older lambs that are spreading disease to younger lambs because there's such a wide age spread in a group. Um, in season, mainly we're synchronizing females to cycle as a group for whatever the reasons. Out of season, um, sometimes it's for synchronizing depending a little bit on the breed. And sometimes it's to get them to actually breed and conceive and get pregnant at a time of year where the sheep normally wouldn't do that. And then in the transitional period, that's that between the in and out of season, there's a period for every breed and every sheep where they may be cycling, but not consistently, or they're sort of thinking about it, but they haven't decided to start cycling. And what we can do is advance the normal breeding season by working within that transitional period if we want to be able to breed just that, you know, maybe four or five weeks earlier than normal, there's ways to help make that more successful. Okay, so just, um, you know, because I think we'll probably have a pretty wide audience of experience today um, in this presentation. So the seasons of the sheep, 
in North America, in Western Canada, where we have what would be referred to as an extreme um, you know, prairie type climate, uh, our normal breeding season for sheep could run anywhere from mid-July to mid-January. And then again, that's very breed dependent. Um, a lot of the breeds like the Rito, the Romanoffs, some of those breeds will definitely have that longer natural season. Um, if you have some of the more heritage breeds, a lot of them are have a much narrower season. Um, I have clients who have Scottish black face sheep. Scotties like to breed in November and December. If you try to breed them in September, the success rate is pretty poor. And that's because they've been genetically selected in a very different environment to this, to have a narrow breeding and a very narrow lambing season. And the breeding season for the, the sheep is dictated by when they want to lamb. Physiologically for survival of the offspring, everybody wants to lamb in the spring when the weather gets better and the grass is starting to grow. So for sheep with a five month gestation, that means they truly wanna breed ideally between mid-September and mid-December. And then you know, we can stretch that a bit. The transitional period would be sort of that June, July, January, maybe February, depending on the breed. And then what we would consider the out of season or non-breeding season here, sort of March, April, May. Those are probably the, some of the three toughest months um, to get sheep pregnant in this scenario. The closer you get to the equator where the day length is not so different, um, the more year round seasonal the sheep become. And if you go to an island situation like the UK, where the seasons, yes, the day length changes similar to here, but the weather doesn't have the extremes, they also tend to have a longer natural breeding season because there's less differences for the sheep. So, you know, working within those parameters, that's, I would call breeding season here, mid August to mid January, non-breeding season, March, April, May for sure. And then you've got these transitional periods on either end, depending on your breed. Okay, so keeping that in mind, and we'll just take a little bit of review about what actually is happening during cycling, during the estrus cycle um, with, with the sheep, what's going on inside the sheep. And that'll make more sense when we then start to talk about some of the management and the synchronizing products we have and why they do and don't work at certain times. So the estrus cycle with an O is the whole 15 to 18 day cycle of a sheep during the normal cycling season. Um, a sheep will come into heat, uh, that's estrus without the O. That's when they do all the normal things you'd expect. They stand for the ram, they get pregnant and they ovulate eggs um, from the ovary as follicles. Once that happens, whether or not they get bred, they go into a diestrous period. So this is a period where they grow something called a corpus luteum. This grows out of the same spot that the follicle was ovulated from. It produces progesterone and it's the progesterone that inhibits them from being in heat. And during that period of time, it also forms new follicles. So if the sheep gets bred in that first estrus and conceives a pregnancy, then they will stall at this point of the corpus luteum and being pregnant. If they're not pregnant, then over time, the corpus luteum goes, I don't have a job. And so it naturally regresses. And as it shrinks, the follicles will start to grow again and they'll come into heat a second time. The little photograph at the bottom shows, that's actually a super, probably a super ovulated ovary for embryo transfer, but those little red donuts, those are your corpus luteum that are producing the progesterone. Looking at this from a hormone standpoint of what's happening in the sheep, during the period of diestrus, there's high levels of progesterone. This is excreted by the corpus luteum. Um, it is what stops the, the heat behavior. It also is the thing that it, early on in the pregnancy, it's what keeps the sheep pregnant until the fetus becomes big enough to produce enough progesterone to take over maintaining the pregnancy. Um, for the odd few of you out there that might have some goat experience, goats are CL dependent for their entire pregnancy. So at no point in a goat can the, does the fetus take over, whereas in sheep it does. And so that becomes a 
bit of an issue for stress and CL regression and abortion in, in the goats that we don't tend to see after about 60 days in sheep. Um, what happens when the progesterone levels start to drop is those CLs will naturally regress if there is no pregnancy. Um, the estrogen will start to climb. So estrogen is produced by the egg or by the follicle, and it's the estrogen that drives the heat behavior. That's what makes the you behave interested in the ram, you know, tail flagging, sometimes headbutting and fighting um, amongst the ewes. If there's a group of them in heat together, it's all, the estrogen is what drives all of that and also makes them appealing to the ram. Um, during that rise, as the estrogen comes to a peak, there's something called an LH surge. That's luteinizing hormone, and that's what actually causes the ovulation to happen. It gets a surge of LH, it ovulates one, two, three eggs, depends again on the, the breed that you have and what their normal prolificacy would be. So I put these two slides in blue separate in the presentation. So if you ever need to go back and find them, they're easy to find. But keep these things in mind as we kind of move forward and talk about um, some of the ways that we can manage reproduction with um, management hormones, behavior management based on what's going on naturally in the sheep. Okay, I'm just gonna talk about ewe lambs quickly. I am a firm believer that ewe lambs need to prove their ability in a natural situation. So ideally ewe lambs should always be bred the first time during the normal natural breeding season. Do have a few clients over the years that lamb out a season and they've selected fall born ewe lambs to go into their June breeding program. Um, but they also know that those ewe lambs in that program are not necessarily reflecting their true capability because we're manipulating them at a significant level. So my choice is ewe lamb management in the natural breeding season, limit the breeding season to 35 days. If you don't, if you can, don't synchronize them, don't do anything to manage them other than that they're well-grown, that they're ready to go. If you introduce a teaser ram for two to three weeks prior to breeding, that's a vasectomized sterile ram, this will help stimulate cycling and it'll also introduce them to ram behavior before the real ram comes in. This alone can increase the conception rate on the first cycle in ewe lambs by 15 to 20%. Because you'll have ewe lambs, they're sitting on the fence, they're not sure if they're quite pubertal gonna cycle or not. And bringing that teaser in will push them over into the cycling. Um, and also a big drooly snotty ram thing coming in and chasing them around is pretty um, yeah, upsetting to a lot of you lambs. And so if they get introduced to that with a teaser first, then when the ram shows up, it's not such a shock and they're actually more likely to get bred in that first cycle, just behaviorally. Um, this 35 days gives you two full cycles, a lambing window of about 45 days, which for some of my clients would be excessively long but it shows you what that ewe lamb can do. She's gonna conceive or not, the number of lambs she's gonna have as a ewe lamb for her breed is gonna be normal or not. And, and so you have, you have a good reflection of, does she meet the criteria to move on in your flock as a mature sheep? I would say you need to expect 95 to 100% conception rate on those ewe lambs. If you do all the management, if your conception rate on your ewe lambs is 50%, then maybe they're not mature enough when you're trying to breed them, or there's other management or nutritional issues going on. Um, and you need to pregnancy test ewe lambs, usually by ultrasound scanning, and you need to cull everything that's open. And that is going to sound absolutely brutal, especially to the purebred people out there, but keeping back ewe lambs that are pubertal that cycle, that say have marked to the ram, put a marker harness on the ram so you know that he's actually breeding them. If they don't conceive as you lambs and you keep them, you are just buying yourself poor fertility for the rest of her life. If she can't do it then, she's actually never gonna do the job you probably want or need her to do. That's my little rant about keeping non-productive animals and my cattle clients get the same rant about heifers. Um, it sounds brutal, but in the long run, over a few years, you'll find that the fertility levels um, in your mature flock will improve by keeping better ULMs strictly from a fertility basis. Obviously, there's other selection criteria. And also, if you scan ULMs, 
um, and cull the opens prior to them turning a year old, then you're selling them as lamb, open lambs. You're not selling them as cull ewes. And depending on the year, um, that usually brings you a better price for them. Too far. Okay, so on to in-season synchronization. So this is during the normal breeding season. Sheep are already cycling naturally. Um, you're not trying to make them cycle. You're just trying to be more efficient about breeding and, and lambing um, timeframes. The one I hear a lot about is prostaglandin. So estromate, it's pretty common. It's been using cattle for years. Uh, it only works in the natural breeding season. The way that the prostaglandin works is when you give that injection of estromate or lutealice, I prefer estromate, so I'll talk about estromate. When you give that injection, what it does is it goes in and it takes the CL on the ovary and it wipes it out. So when you do that, then the progesterone level will drop. And if you go back to the hormone thing, estrogen will rise, follicles will rise, and the sheep should come into heat. It can't work if there's no CL present. So if you have sheep that are either not cycling because of the season, because of their age, because they're young, or because they're just not cycling for some other physiological or medical reason, estromate is not going to work. I've had people call me and say they did estromate in May and they had zero cycling. And I said, well, it's because they weren't cycling to begin with. You can't work with something that doesn't exist. So where your estromate is going to be most effective in season is during the diesterous period. So during estrus, it's not effective because during estrus, we have big follicles. We don't have CLs at this point. Right? They're in heat, they're breeding. Once they get into the diesterous period and you start to have a functional CL, then the, the, project, uh, the prostaglandin, the estromate can do its job. And so um, please ignore the 14 days in the brackets behind the 10. I stole some of these slides from the lecture I give to the vet students. And the 14 days would apply to goats because they have a 21 day cycle, not a 14 day cycle. Um, so there, so that's, and. The other thing is by law of averages in a population of 100 ewes, um, there'll be about 75% of them on any given day will be in this diesterous period where the prostaglandin will be effective. Some of them, it'll work because they're about to come into heat whether you gave them drugs or not because they're just prior to estrus. And some of them have just been in heat in the last two or three days and so it's not gonna work on them because they don't have a significant enough corpus luteum yet for it to work. So if you do a single injection, you'll get about 70, 75% of the sheep should come into heat after that first injection. If you want all of the group to come into heat and get bred all at the same time, then you need to wait 11 days and give a second dose because all the ones that came into heat off the first dose, plus anybody who wasn't in the correct phase of their cycle, by the second dose, everybody should land in the correct phase for the estimate to work. It's a fair bit of handling. It's a fair bit of injecting. It's not my favorite way to do things now that we have better options, but it is still a viable option and there are still people out there that um, want to use it. Um, I didn't put it in the presentation. The dose for estimate in sheep is one mil. You won't find that on the bottle. Um, it says two mils because it's only labeled for cattle, but one mil um, is effective in sheep. Okay, our second choice for in-season synchronization is to give them some sort of external progesterone source. So when you think about where the hormones are at, if you put progesterone into their bloodstream from an outside source like a cedar, um, and we'll talk about them a little bit. What happens is as long as they're absorbing progesterone from the cedar, then they, will, they won't come into heat because it blocks the progression on the ovary. It sits there like it's ha like having a CL that won't go away. And so as long as the progesterone level is high, they won't form follicles and they won't come into heat. When you remove that source of progesterone, then the progesterone drops just like it would naturally, and the animal will come into heat from the drop in progesterone. 
So there's two main sources. I'm going to talk about cedars. The information there for MGA to add to bead is present on a slide. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Before we had cedars, um, there were large flocks using it. It can be very hit and miss, and it can be very difficult to manage the feeding of it so that every sheep gets the right amount. They have to be fed twice a day, and it has to be put into a pelleted ration. Um, it's too fine a powder and too small a quantity to just hand mix it. So it's certainly not, a, I don't think, a viable option for a smaller operation. And I say smaller, like probably if you're feeding less than a few hundred use to use that technique. So with the cedars that we now have available, um, there's a picture of them here along with the applicator. They're super easy to put in, super easy to take out. They don't stick like the old sponges used to, for those of you who remember those. Um, and they do a very good job of providing an external progesterone source. So what happens with the cedar is basically you're just keeping your progesterone level high until you decide that you want it to drop and you want the sheep to come into heat. The, for those of you who are not familiar with cedars, they're a plastic item with kind of a rubbery skin on the outside of them. That rubbery skin is impregnated with natural progesterone. And so they absorb that through the vaginal wall. They're inserted in the vagina and they're, the progesterone is absorbed through the vaginal wall while the cedar's inserted. So just at the top, my little biosecurity thing, keep your applicator clean between your use slash dose and disinfect if you're gonna, if you're gonna share them with your neighbor disinfect the applicators in Vercon and give them a really good scrub because you don't want to be transmitting something like chlamydia um, from a non-clinical carrier in one flock into another flock. Cedars in use, and I keep this handy if you decide you want to use cedars because the package, the information on the package for the use of cedars is for out of season breeding. And if you follow those instructions during the natural breeding season, you will have a colossal failure of the cedars. When the sheep is cycling naturally, the cedar needs to be in there for at least half of the normal cycle because you don't know where that sheep is in her cycle when you insert the cedar. So they can be put in for 10 to 16 days. You've got a, a range there. So I have clients who have large groups of sheep and limited numbers of rams. And so they'll put them all in on the same day and then pull them some every day or some every other day. You've got a window of opportunity there, which management wise means you can at least insert them all the same day. You don't have to divide the groups prior to insertion. You can divide the groups for breeding as you pull them out. Generally speaking, um, in the normal season, females come into heat 24 to 48 hours after cedar removal. In my personal experience, if you put a ram out with a marker harness on, and he is not marked to you within 72 hours of pulling the cedar, she has not cycled appropriately off the cedar and she's not going to until her next cycle. So realistically for, for synchronized breeding, the rams only need to be in with the ewes for two or three days and can be removed because then unless you're gonna leave them in for a cleanup cycle, a second cycle, if they haven't, cycled and got bred by 72 hours, they're not going to. They will remain loosely synchronized for the next cycle. So if you want to leave the ram in for a cleanup cycle, the upside is at lambing is you'll have hopefully a big group lambing quite tight, and then you'll have a little break, but you'll know when to expect the next group because they'll, they'll be roughly two weeks later, but they'll stay together as a group. So they should still lamb reasonably close together over maybe a few days or a week. Um, I would suggest introducing males at 12 to 24 hours after removal. If you have mature experienced breeding males and you wanna put them in as you're pulling the cedars because that's just convenient for time management, that's fine. Um, if you have younger, less experienced males and throw them in right away, the ewes do have a different smell from having had the cedars. And so sometimes they'll just, they'll start breeding too soon and kind of exhaust themselves before they actually need to be doing the job. So I always wait at least 12 hours before I turn the rams out. PMSG, uh, pregnant serum, serum gonadotropin in this country is either Novermon or Polygon or the two brands. They, it can be used as cedar removal during the natural breeding season. It certainly doesn't need to be. Um, it will tend to increase ovulation rate. 
So if you have prolific sheep and you don't want to have five lambs, you probably don't want to use PMSG. It does increase the synchrony within the group. So if you use PMSG, the ewes are gonna come into heat even tighter than that 48 hour window. They might all be in heat between 18 and 36 hours. Um, we use it for AI and embryo transfer programs because we need them to be in all the ewes in a group to be in a very tight heat, but then we're gonna breed them. We're not asking a ram to do that. Um, it is essential to use in out of season programs to force the ovulation. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, when we talk about out of season. Cedars come in bags of 20, um, should be available through your local veterinarians if you're stuck and they either can't or won't get them in, um, then let me know, we will sell them to people. Um, and the other thing is if, you, if there's people who have a small number that they wanna do this with, I do have a few people who have little groups of pet sheep and they have five and they kind of like them to all lamb close together, um, we will split bags for people and sell them individually. And most clinics won't do that. So get a hold of us if you need to. Okay, the, here's the information on the MGA. Like I say, it's, it is cost effective, but you need to have large numbers and you need to have the feed made and that's becoming more of a challenge. So the information's here for people who are interested, but I haven't had a client use it in a few years now because it's just got too many other headaches that go with trying to do it this way. Okay, so out of season synchronization. So here's, I guess, some of the reasons that people do it. One is to hit the higher market lambs. Uh, lambing in, you know, November, December, often 4-H market, the Easter market, but you have to convince the sheep that they want to do that. Um, some people are doing it to use their labor in their facilities better. So they have one or two different groups of sheep and they lamb them at different times of the year. Um, it is tougher to get good conception rates. I firmly believe that no matter what breed you have, you cannot just turn a ram out and expect to have enough sheep get pregnant to not just make your life a headache. Um, so it does require some drugs and some manipulation. The other thing is genetic selection. Um, some breeds have a longer season and breed out a season better than others. The Ile de France in France, about 70% of them are bred in June for fall lambs. And so they've been genetically selected for that more than some breeds. Ritos, Dorsets, the Katahdins, the Romanoffs are longer season breeders, um, but there's still a lot of variation within a breed. So going to an out of season breeding program, often the first year is a bit of an experiment where you set up a big group and you see who plays the game. And then going forward, you try to use the ewes and their daughters who did it for you initially you, you kind of select a group that breeds out of season better within your flock. The other thing is ram fertility is lower out of season. So you have to have less use per ram to breed, especially synchronized than you would in the normal breeding season. So you need to keep that in mind. And also there is a bit of a hereditary factor. So if, if the long-term plan on your farm is to be able to breed some of your ewes or all of your ewes out of season, then ideally being able to keep ewe lambs that were fall born, that were born out of that out of season breeding will hopefully increase your odds that those ewes coming into your flock will breed out of season themselves. So you can kind of stack your odds a little bit. That said, I still think that even with drugs and manipulation, if you can breed out of season and get about a 75, 70% conception rate, you should be very happy with that. And your prolificacy, you will see more singles if you're breed normally twins. And if you have a more prolific breed like a Rito, you're probably going to see more twins and singles and less triplets. The, naturally, the number of ovulations tends to be lower in the out of season as well. So the main methods of doing this, um, one is to use progesterone and PMSG, and the other is through day length manipulation. So basically faking the sheep into thinking it's fall, even though it isn't. So this is basically what's going on on the ovary of sheep that are in the non-breeding season that aren't cycling. They just have these static ovaries that are doing nothing. So you can see why prostaglandins are not going to make these sheep cycle because there's no CL to lice because they're not active. So you have to do something to stimulate the ovary to actually become active if you want success. And that's also why if you just put a ram out, that doesn't necessarily work either. So what we do is we add progesterone 
in the form of a cedar. Progesterone goes in for seven to nine days. I think the package says five to nine days. I've never been brave enough to go as short as five days. I usually tell my clients seven to nine days will, and that presence of the progesterone, suddenly the ovary goes, oh, there's some progesterone here. I should make some, I should develop some follicles. So you're basically faking the ovary into thinking that it's starting a natural cycle, that there were CLs there. There aren't, but it doesn't know that. You've given it progesterone. So then when you remove the cedar, you've got these follicles that have developed. One of two things can happen. One, the follicle could ovulate naturally and the sheep could breed, get pregnant. The other is that she'll go through all the appropriate behaviors because she's got follicles and she's producing estrogen, but they have what they call a non-ovulatory cycle. So the follicles don't actually ovulate. So she behaves correctly, the ram breeds her, and then the pregnancy rate is very poor. And that's because they didn't actually release the follicle or release the egg. The sperm can't fertilize something that's not there. So that's where we use the PMSG injection at cedar pole. The PMSG basically stimulates the eggs to ovulate and it increases your success rate in out of season breeding quite significantly. That's pretty basic simple as far as the using the cedars. Um, manipulation of day length. So basically, again, you're basically convincing the sheep that it's fall, even though it's not, and that the days are getting shorter, even though they're actually getting longer, considering June's the longest day of the year. Um, the original method of doing this requires an absolutely light, tight barn. You cannot have any leaks of light. It does not require very much light to stimulate the pineal gland in the sheep. And so even the amount of light that would come through like barn fans, wall fans, is too much. Um, so it's never really been very popular in Western Canada because a lot of us don't have those type of barns. Um, more common in Eastern Canada because they house their sheep because of rain and heavy snow, and they tend to have more access to the type of barns that they could make work for this. There is a protocol there for how to do it if you have the ability to confine them in a light type barn. The uh, one big thing to remember in all of this is that the rams and the bucks need to be in the barn in like under the same light conditions. They need to think it's fall as well. And we'll talk a little bit in, I'll just, when I get to the rams, we'll talk a little bit about why that is. Um, there's also on a MAFRA's website, um, they give you some charts about if you want to breed May 15th, then you need to start your, your uh, long days, your light days, December 15th. It gives you some time frames. Um, but like I say, for most people, it's not an option because they don't have the barn facility to do it. Um, there has been some new research out of Quebec. Um, Joanne Cameron was involved in this. And what they've done is they've decided that instead of trying to put them in a light tight barn and make the days shorter, that you make the days long, so 22 hours for a period of time so that the sheep think the days are long, even though it's winter and they're not long. Um, and then when you turn the lights off, as long as you have an eight hour drop in day length, so it drops down to 14 hours, then the sheep thinks there's enough of a drop that it's, that it's fall and they can start cycling. Um, and this can be done with yard lights or it could be done in like tarp barns with, with lights you can, you can manage on a timer to turn on and off. Um, we do a little bit of a version of this if we have rams that stand in our barn all the way through the winter after collection and they're staying for the next year. If we want to start collecting early, we start running them under 22 hour days in February. And then when we turn the lights off at the beginning of July, it drops the day length enough. You do have to remember that in Alberta, the longest day of the year is just about 18 hours. So right around the middle of June, it's hard to even make this work because our days are so long. But certainly on the beginning of June and once you get into the beginning of July, this method can work. Okay, in the transitional period, basically the goal usually is to be able to breed a little earlier than you normally would. So you wanna get them cycling. Um, the best method for doing this, if they're kind of sitting on the fence and it's August and you wanna breed in August to September is to use a vasectomized teaser. So this is a ram, hormonally, 
everything, he's a ram, he's a male, he behaves as a male, except he's to have a vasectomy, so he's sterilized. Um, this, you can see this picture, the Romanoff ram in the middle is a teaser with a bunch of woolly white sheep. I recommend often my clients choose a teaser that's a breed that's not their breed so that when they're drinking their coffee and they look out the window in the morning, they don't have a panic attack. They go, oh yeah, we put the teaser out yesterday, not, oh my God, the rams are out with the ewes. Because that's kind of, I, I've had a client do that and then realized it was just the teaser. So in a teaser, what you want is something that is a long season breed a Rito or Romanoff, uh, the Katahdin hair sheep work quite well as teasers and with a strong libido. Their only job is to go out there and make those girls think they want to get bred. Um, and so they, that's the, what you're looking for in a, in a teaser. They don't have to be pretty. It's nice if they're quiet and well-mannered because you have to deal with them. Um, there's a procedure in here for using that ram effect on them about when to place them in and when to replace with the natural breeding rams. Um, and so this can be quite effective a way to just bring your breeding season if you want to start it a little bit sooner and you're not horribly worried about them being tightly synchronized for lambing. This will give you roughly synchronized groups, but you're still going to probably have, you know, a three to four week lambing period um, once you introduce the rams. I think everybody should own a teaser. I think that's for all kinds of things. It's just a requirement. And you would, if your normal breeding season starts, say, first of September, um, then you could you say move it up as early as late July. You can usually buy about six weeks on your normal season. The one teaser to 50 females is just so he doesn't die of exhaustion and has nothing to do with fertility, obviously. Okay, just a little bit of time here. I've got a few minutes to mention um, breeding management in males because in all of this, we talk about the ewes and the cedars and what we're gonna do with them and everything else. And then everybody just like goes and grabs the ram out of the pen and throws him out there and thinks, oh, he can do his job, no problem, with no sort of pre-thought as to where the ram is at. So semen takes six to eight weeks to go from its first cell stage to a mature, useful sperm. And so you need to start thinking about preparing your rams for the breeding season six to eight weeks prior to when you need them. So routine management procedures like deworming if you're doing that, shearing, foot trimming, you know, any of those type of things, you don't want to be doing those three days before you put the ram out. Nothing makes me crazier than to go and semen test rams that they're putting out in the week and they trim the feet while we're doing it and they trim a foot too short. Now the ram is lame and he has to go breed sheep in three days. Try to do all those things well ahead. So if there's going to be any issues or you're going to discover an issue, you've got time to deal with it. Severe stress or illness can damage season or semen. So fever, frostbite, poor nutrition. Um, sometimes even if new rams have mixed and they've had a big old punch up gang fight in the pen, that can be enough to cause semen quality to decline. And it can take six to eight weeks to have good, healthy sperm coming behind that. And so you need to consider all of those things. Um, body condition scoring, I like to see rams at about a three and a half. If they're out there doing their job, they, they will lose weight. Um, so you want them a little bit better conditioned at the start of breeding. But over fat males have poor libido because they're fat. Um, and often semen quality is decreased. They can pack a fair bit of fat in the scrotum. And that kind of cooks the semen, especially breeding out of season. Then. Fat, lazy males in June don't do a very good job breeding ewes because they just don't care. Then I was quick, I was slow in a the draw there for a question that's come in the chat from Justin. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll probably butcher it, but isn't it epid did a mectomy? An epididectomy? <laughs> uh, yeah, you say that 10 times fast. As effective as a vasectomy. Absolutely. Both, both procedures work equally well for the teaser as far as making him sterile. I do vasectomies because I'm quick at them. It takes about 10 minutes to do them. And there's a single incision on the side of the ram that when they lay down, their testicles don't stick out behind them. They tuck them underneath their belly. And so then the incision's up against their belly. So for healing, it stays nice and clean and dry. But if a person, if a vet's not comfortable doing that, would rather take the epididymis off, which is that little knob on the bottom of the testicle. If they remove the epididymis, they've effectually, effectively removed where the ram stores the semen and there's no passageway. Um, it's the version of the Coquihalla Highway right now. 
you just took out the bridge. And so that either procedure is fine. I just, like I say, the vasectomies, they're quick, they heal quickly. I don't have issues then with a, an incision or sutures right along the bottom of the scrotum where, you know, the, I think the potential for them getting dirty, especially if you're doing them, like if I'm doing them in the fall and it's kind of wet and disgusting out, I just think in, the risk of infection is less. So, but whichever the vet's comfortable with is going to work equally well as far as producing a teaser for you. I think that's the key thing is if, if they do a vasectomy and they don't do it right, um, and they take out something other than the vas deferens, um, you will have a teaser that's still fertile. And I had a student who graduated from Saskatoon a couple of years ago who took a course from me and she called me and said, so I just went and semen tested six teaser rams that are not teasers, they're still rams. And so she had to try to go in and re them through the scar tissue and stuff. And she said, I have no idea what the person took out, but it wasn't the vas, so they weren't sterile. So that was a disaster because the guy found out when he started lambing two weeks early with a bunch of crossbred lambs. So that was not. So either technique, as long as it's done well, I think is just fine. Perfect. Thank you, Lynn. Okay. Ram to you ratios. We also need to consider this. So the age of rams. Ram lambs, as you probably all know, cannot have the same expectations put on them as mature rams. So in an unsynchronized natural breeding in season, you know, ram with good testicle size and semen quality situation, a mature ram should be able to breed 30 to 50 ewes in that say 35 day two cycle window. That should not be a challenge for him. There's certainly rams that would probably breed more than that. Ram lambs, we generally recommend 15 to 20 and to pay attention when you first put them out because sometimes it takes them a while to figure out which end they're supposed to be breeding. They're usually smarter than, than bull, you know, yearling bulls, but make sure they're actually performing the task and that it's not about fertility, then it's about understanding the job. Um, rams also have a seasonality. Again, you know, depending on your breed, are you breeding at peak time? Are you breeding out of season? Are you breeding in the transitional season? You need to think about that with what you're asking of the rams as well. Size of the breeding area, especially if they're synchronized. Rams, if rams have to travel huge distances between in-heat ewes, they're not gonna be able to breed as many sheep. That, that's just a fact of time and space. So out in big pasture situations, I always recommend, especially for synchronized breeding, is keep them in in smaller pens, if at all possible, or small paddocks. Get them bred. The rams only need to be in there for a short period of time. Pull your rams out or leave them in for the cleanup cycle and then kick them back out into a bigger area. But don't ask the ram to cover, you know, 10 ewes a day for a week on a synchronized breeding program in 160 acres because the poor guy's going to die of exhaustion, um, especially out of season when it's hot, because again, you know, they don't like to truck around when it's 35 degrees in Balkan, Alberta. Um, single sire and multiple sire groups. Um, I'm a big believer in single sire, but that has a lot to do with the fact that I think if you have multiple sire groups and you have good lambs and poor lambs, you don't know who's or who's. Um, but you can get a situation where the rams actually spend more time competing with one another, especially with synchronized ewes, because there's a lot of estrogen in a synchronized group. They spend more time fighting than breeding, and that's counterproductive. Um, you know, again, divide them up. I, I had a few clients that figured out they had some dud rams. I mean, their, their semen tests were fine, but libido wise, they had some dud rams once they split them up um, because they didn't breed their groups well. And they've been, uh, they've been carrying those rams for several years, but didn't know that the rams weren't actually contributing anything to the flock. Um, if you're going to do synchronized breeding in season, then Mature rams, you need to drop them down to about 10 to 15, depending on the ram. Um, and ram lambs, probably drop them down to kind of the five to 10 um, situation. I have to make my little thing go away. So, oh. um, okay. Uh, and then out of season, mature rams, five to 10 ewes. Now that's per day. I have clients who breed, they have limited rams. So they'll breed a group of say 350. 
and they've got 10 rams and so they'll go okay well if we've got 10 rams that means 35 ewes go to each ram we're going to breed over a week so that means each ram gets five new ewes one every 24 hours because realistically he should be done breeding the first five by the time the next five come into heat right because you're going to stagger your cedar pull out every day so that's on a sort of per 24 hour basis. I would not recommend ram lambs out of season period. If they were spring born and they're coming yearlings, maybe because they've been through a pubertal season in the fall naturally and they've matured. If they are fall born and they're six months old in the spring, I would not use them. My concern is that they haven't actually had a normal season to hit puberty yet. And I think you could be massively disappointed. So that that it's my recommendation. I don't have any clients who are using ram lambs out of season. They just let them grow up a little bit. Um, just a little bit. So you wrap your head around se semen production in these guys. Begins at puberty, obviously. That's going to vary with age, breed, and season. So I often find that fall-born ram lambs do not really hit puberty. And they may be fertile, but are they functionally useful for any significant breeding before they're almost a year old? Because they hit six, seven, eight months of age in the spring, which is not a normal season. So they just don't kind of hit that puberty until they start getting into their first normal breeding season in the fall as a you know coming yearly. Um, 47 days, so six to eight weeks for functional mature sperm to be produced. That's just a fact. And so anything that happens that could knock sperm out, you could be six to eight weeks for fertility to come back on that ram. That said, healthy mature rams, 10 billion sperm a day. They can breed a few sheep with that. Breeding soundness exams, I'm a big proponent of this prior to breeding season, especially if you're gonna breed out of season. Nothing more disappointing than all the drugs and all the work into the ewes and putting rams out in June that just don't have the semen quality to do the job. Testicle size does decrease, semen production goes down, libido goes down, and semen quality declines in the out of season. That's just a natural, the ram's not thinking he's really needing it right now, so it tends to drop off a bit. Doesn't make them sterile but it certainly decreases. And that's why we decrease the numbers you can read to um, as well. And I think it's important to, to semen test them and make sure that the rams that have been chosen are gonna be able to do the job. And in our semen facility, we quit collecting semen typically by the end of January, because in early February, we collect it, it looks okay, but it doesn't freeze. By mid -feb or by late January, early February, mid February, we collect it and it looks okay, but it doesn't look good after we've chilled it. We don't even bother trying to freeze it. By the end of February, the rams just look at us and go, what do you want us to do? Like they don't even have any interest in collecting. And so, you know, I think that's reflected in the natural population. So we have to remember that. Um, the reason I have these pictures here, and yes, I will admit the one in the middle is a dairy goat. It's not a sheep. Um, if you look behind a, a ram or a ram lamb and you can't actually see the testicles, they're not big enough. I mean, you can measure them and everything else. We do all those things. But sheep, you should be able to see those testicles. If you can't see them, they're pretty darn tiny. And so, you know, there's your first culling process if you're looking at uh, ram lambs. Or if you're looking at a ram that all of a sudden had good testicles and now it has something happened that the testicle has, has basically atrophied because that can happen through trauma and a few other things. Well, so these are just the things that are generally done um, as far as a breeding soundness exam. This part of it, every farmer could do for themselves. You don't need a vet to do this for you and it will help you a world in assessing where your rams are at. So obviously, you know, health and breeding history. Did they breed before? Are they healthy? Are they good body condition? Um, scrotal measurement palpation. Um, Measuring testicles, there's a technique to it, but it's not rocket science. Um, I have a few clients that do their own. I've sold them the tape to do it. And just like in any other species, the size of the testicle does reflect on their ability to produce sperm. 
Tiny testicles do not produce as much sperm as bigger testicles. That's just a fact. Um, also, you can check for if they're cryptorchids. I have gone to semen test rams that I go, you do know he only has one testicle, right? And they didn't. Um, examining the penis in the sheath just to make sure there's no scars, adhesions, injuries, anything like that. Um, you can actually get the penis to extend on a ram quite easily if you sit them in the shearing position and then roll them forward. They'll, that puts pressure on the sigmoid flexure. Um, which is just above the scrotum, and it'll push the tip of the penis out. So if you have any concerns that, you know, there might have been an injury or anything. And then semen collection and evaluation. I'm a big proponent, but I will tell you that on the whole, rams that meet all these other criteria that are in good shape, good health, and have good testicle size that palpate normally, um, those rams typically have good semen. Um, so even if a person just did that much, you're a long ways towards discovering a problem to solve or getting rid of rams that aren't up to the task. But then we can go on and actually do semen evaluation. Um, this just gives you what we use as criteria for scrotal circumferences. Um, and I'm pretty brutal about that. Small testicles, I put a big F on the semen evaluation, no matter what semen looks like, especially if they're for sale. This is what the scrotal tapes look like. Um, we sell them if people want one, they're about $45 and it'll probably last you a lifetime. I wear out about one every year, but I use mine a lot. So um, so yeah, so I think, you know, if, if more people started looking at the, those criteria, um, you could help yourself a long way on assessing your rams. And then as part of, far as actual semen evaluation, um, we collect them with an ejaculator, just like with bulls. There is a bit of a finesse in the technique to doing it in rams. I have heard some horror stories. Um, so if you're going to ask your local vet, the first thing is, do they have a ram probe? Because if they don't, they can't do it. Um, and do they have any experience doing rams? Because I have heard some horror stories about rams that basically were run on cattle cycles and cattle, the power levels in the machine. And it was horrible for the rams, I'm sure, and for the owners. Um, so it does take a little bit of finesse, but absolutely can be done. I have done some groups of rams in um, May and June for people who are breeding out a season where the rams have had really good semen quality. So it is possible. Um, I think as more people go to some out of season breeding, we need to be more selective for rams that can provide that service because not all rams will do that and not all breeds do it well. All right, look at that on time. And this is the end goal. Everybody wants to see lambs in the straw in the springtime or the fall, depending on what you're doing with your manipulated breeding. Perfect, thank you, Dr. Lynn. Uh, with that, we'll give an opportunity for a couple questions and then uh, we will make some decisions on next steps here. So I would open, just as a reminder, uh, everyone is muted. So if you do want to ask a question, you can type in the chat to have me moderate it or unmute to ask a question. Their minds are blown. I just had a question. You were talking about um, the estimate and the one mil dosage. Yep. Is that per time like if you did the two yes yes so you one, did the one, one and then 10 days later you do yeah. one mil again yes okay i was i i was told a half a mil we just it's our first time doing it just recently so i'll I'll, think, I'll get back to her about that <laughs> yeah i think you you could go and i certainly i've worked in programs in the uk where they go as low as half a mil um, one mil I know absolutely for sure should work, um, but if you're doing ewe lambs or some of the lighter breeds, perhaps, um, sure. one, half a mil will probably work 99% of the time. So, I mean, I certainly wouldn't be averse to going with half a mil. Right. I'll just have a discussion with our vet just to yeah. Yeah, see. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia, for the question. Are there any other questions? For Dr. Lynn Tate. Oh, 
All right, that concludes uh, today's presentation on technique for managing breeding in sheep presentation. And I just want to thank Dr. Lin for your presentation. Uh, I really appreciate your blunt approach to ewe lamb management and providing all these multiple different techniques uh, for managing breeding in sheep. So thank you very much. Um, also for those on the call, uh, that may want to review some of this content of, of today's presentation. It will be made available to all producers through the Alberta Lamb Producers YouTube channel, Alberta Sheep Central. I encourage you uh, to check out our channel and subscribe for notifications. Uh, we have quite a few historical videos as well as all the 2021 webinar series uh, uploaded to that channel. So with that, I'm...